Okay, please come to order. Um, the 2019 annual town meeting is now back in session. We will be starting with Article 37, but I have a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to mention. Uh, first, Article 47, Bylaw Amendment, Residential Old Historic Ground Cover Ratio, had been called by Dr. Butterworth. Um, he's withdrawn his call of that article. So unless anyone wants to step into Dr. Butterworth's shoes, I'm going to throw that article into a pot and vote it with maybe some other uncalled articles. Okay. I do not see anyone stepping forward, so. Oh, yeah, is there a hand up back there? Can I have your name? Chandra Miller? Okay. So Ms. Miller is going to be in Dr. Butterworth's shoes there. All right, and on article 53, zoning bylaw amendment swimming pools. Um, Carol Langer had called that article and she's withdrawn her call of article 53 that had received a take no action recommendation from the finance committee. Is there anyone who wants to propose a positive motion on article 53 and go into Ms. Langer's shoes? Okay. I'd well I'd need I'd need a positive motion to like move Okay, you take a moment to read it. Um Ms. Mooney, did you you had called I think a number of articles? If you want to get a microphone, I think you wanted to say something. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Erica Mooney, and I called Articles 38, 39, 43, 44, 45, and 51 because I was worried about the expansion of the CN Zoning District as that is one of two zoning districts where marijuana dispensaries are allowed. Upon discussion with the article sponsors and proponents, I am withdrawing my calls on these articles, although I do still do carry concerns about expanding districts where marijuana is located. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, does anyone want to step into Ms. Mooney's shoes on articles you don't have to have all of them. You could cherry pick them if you want, or none of them. 38, 39, 43, 44, 45, and 51. Okay. So where are we with the swimming pools? No, okay. Um, I, th I have a feeling that we haven't seen the last of the swimming pool article, so I would stay tuned for a future town meeting on that one probably. Okay, so that being said, I am going to recognize Uh, let's see, I guess I will recognize Mr. Rector as chairman of the planning board for the purpose of making a motion with respect to articles 38, 39, 43, 44, 45, 51 and 53. So moved, Madam Moderator. Wait a minute. Sorry. 
no, no. That, that's it. <clears throat> Let me just make sure I got them all. 38, yes. 39, 43, 44, 45, 51, 51, that's it, and 53. And the motion is moved that articles 38, 39, 43, 44, 45, 47, 51, and 53 Oh, not 47, sorry. 38, 39, 44, 45, 51, and 53. I didn't realize you guys were so fast. See, they're so fast, they're doing it before I even know it. Move that the following articles be voted as recommended and or amended by the Finance Committee or as recommended and or amended by the Planning Board as printed in the Finance Committee report with technical amendments brought forward during the course of the meeting. 38, 39, 43, 44, 45, 51, and 53. Is that your motion, Mr. Director? Yes, it is, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Is there a second? Second that, Madam Moderator. Motion is made and seconded. Um, because these are zoning articles, they do require a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt that motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. Just to remind you, when you're voting, you're voting on the motions as printed in the warrant and as affected by any technical amendments that I read into the record last night. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. That motion is adopted by a declared two-thirds vote. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so without any further ado, we will go to Article 37, which is on page 47 to 48 of the warrant. Uh, the motion is as printed in the warrant. And I will recognize Mr. Worth, Chairman of the Finance Committee, for the purpose of making that motion. That's our motion, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Second. Motion is made and seconded. Um, Mr. Glidden, I know you're in here somewhere. Oh, there you are. You're the sponsor. If you could kind of set this up for us, that would be great. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Tobias Glidden, 24 Rugged Road. So a little bit of history on this article. Um, I've been very interested in affordable housing ever since 2008 happened. And we've had a very serious conversation about housing um, ever since then. <clears throat> and one of the fascinating things I observed about 2008 to 2012 was we lost a significant portion of year-round homes to the summer market. We lost a lot of year-round families. And carrying on to this day, we have consistently see every year we lose year-round homes to summer residents. We're consistently under threat to 40Bs and overdevelopment. And I've heard a lot of concerns from the community about density. And so in working with a number of folks, all across the island and a number of um, folks in our town government, I worked to draft this article. And what it does is it aims to purchase existing units that already conform with zoning and put them on the subsidized housing inventory. The reason for this article is that we need to think about this problem at scale. We have suffered an affordable housing crisis for decades, and we have failed to think of it at scale. Now, when I say scale, I'm talking about 1% of the town's budget that this works out to be. I believe our budget needs to reflect our priorities as a community, and so I think 1% is viable. Currently, you know, Tucker Holland talked last night about how we have 900 people on island looking for housing. The need is great. Mr. Lowell talked last night about you know, people coming over and hanging out by his grill and cooking up codfish and whatnot. We need to think big. We need to support the people that live here. And we need to provide 
some human decency and think big about solving this problem. So I'd encourage you to vote for Article 37, and I'd encourage you to vote on Proposition 8 on the ballot on April 9th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bridges? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Jason Bridges, Chair of the Select Board. On behalf of the Select Board, uh, which is, I'd like to make a motion to amend uh, the FinCom motion to 20 million, from 10 million to 20 million. That is consistent with our comment on this article. Is there a second? Okay, motion is made and seconded. Um, on the amendment, does anyone want to talk about the amendment, just the amendment? Okay, so that amendment requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt the amendment. A no vote will defeat the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That amendment is adopted. So now we're on the main motion as amended by Mr. Bridges. Uh, Mr. Worth? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, good evening. Um, this article um, occupied an enormous amount of time on the Finance Committee as well as spending time with the proponents. So I'd like to um, take a few minutes to give you a little background so you know what went into the thinking that we had as to why uh, we um, took an article that was originally asking for $30 million and made a, a positive motion for 10. Um, but before I do that, just to, um, I think everybody knows that the Finance Committee in this town has a role to basically advise and make recommendations to you all as to the budget and other areas of finance. And we take that uh, responsibility pretty seriously. And to fulfill those responsibilities, we meet uh, through most of the winter. Um, we do a Saturday session that takes up three quarters of the day uh, in the end of January to review budgets. A lot of time goes into our, uh, our deliberations. Some of you may remember over the past few years that the Finance Committee pushed back against the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in some of their requests. That might be perhaps not well known to folks because oftentimes those things were worked out when we had our Finance Committee meetings, but we have been strongly pushing over the years for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to get a strategic plan in place so that they knew and you, the voters who were giving them the money, knew how it was going to be spent. And I'm very pleased, as was the Finance Committee, that they retained professional help and have delivered a strategic plan. And that's why the motion for $5 million to go to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, was um, received a positive motion from the Finance Committee, and you all voted for it um, last night. Look, this, we all know affordable housing is sort of a, uh, certainly an emotional issue here on the island, and as Tobias said, it has been, and those who grew up here like, like I and many others did, this has been a problem that's been with us for years and years. Over the four plus hours that we deliberated uh, on this article, and many of them spent with the proponents, uh, we came to a fair number of conclusions. The major issues that we saw, and it really begins with the fact that this is probably the most expensive way we can try to solve a portion of our affordable housing problem. The cost to subsidize these units on the shy list, 11 of them, because that's what the proponents have put forth, and I should say that when we first engaged in discussion and asked for some financial information, a pro forma, fairly standard, to understand the underlying numbers on this article, uh, we uh, 
what we received was not adequate. We asked them to go back. We even had somebody from the Finance Committee volunteer their time to help them put together a pro forma that uh, a business entity could, could look at and make, make some sense of. Anyway, the issue here is the, in order to be on the shy list, you have to be at 80% of area median income. When you do out the numbers of purchasing these units and the rent that's going to be received, minus the costs of managing the properties, we are at a number of subsidy of 700,000 per year or 64,000 per year of subsidy per unit. And that's net of any rent that's being paid. This is an incredibly expensive way to deal with our problem. The other thing on this article is it's predicated not just on buying properties, it's also predicated on building new properties, secondary and tertiary dwellings on each of these lots. And that is really the only way that the average rents can be brought up because you will have, you can then put people with higher uh, area median incomes into those units. We did not see an operating plan on how this was going to function. And in fact, we're told at one meeting that it's really up to the town to figure out how this was going to be implemented. So there's no plan on who's gonna build the units. There's no criteria on what units are going to be purchased. And there's no plan on how they're going to be managed. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is not in the business of owning the properties or managing them, has been tentatively identified as the receivers of this, these funds because they are, as I understand it, the only entity in town that can receive tax-exempt bond financing, which again, this article uh, hinges on. So it all came down to the fact that we just did not see enough of a plan to give us confidence that we could in good conscience recommend to you, the voters, to spend 20 million or 30 million dollars. What we talked about was something that's reasonably common in business, which when presented with some new ideas, is to do a proof of concept or do some sort of demonstration. Let's see if in fact, this is idea, which you know, arguably is a, is a good idea, actually works in practice. Can we organizationally pull this together and execute on this, or is this just going to end up being another um, effort that uh, we'll look back on and say it could have been different? I think what I want to end with is sort of an analogy, or not sort of, with an analogy. So, um, I walk into the bank, you're all the bankers, and I say to you, I've got this great idea. Not quite sure how I'm gonna execute it. Don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I really like you to give me $20 million and we'll see how it works. So that's a little bit of the background and rationale for why the Finance Committee ended up where it did. This is not on the part of the Finance Committee an anti uh, affordable housing vote or recommendation. This is really us, I think, fulfilling our fiduciary responsibility to all of you to, um, you know, to, for us to make sure that your taxpayer dollars and the taxpayer dollars, the people that are not here, is wisely spent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before I start taking comments, I just want to do a, one piece of housekeeping. In Mr. Bridges' motion, there was a, a little bit of language cleanup. So in addition to the 20 million, 20 million, he wanted to strike with the approval of the select board, which may include and, and had, have it read instead to be spent by the town manager through a grant or grants to the Nantucket affordable housing trust with pre-approval of all expenditures and ongoing oversight required by the select board. And then further down, 
the word tenants is changed to households. So I'd ask for your unanimous consent just to make that a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay, so on Article 37, as moved by the Finance Committee and amended by Mr. Bridges. Uh, yeah, I have someone up in the back and then I'll come down to you, Ms. Zoda. Yeah, way up in the back. Uh, Patrick Tave. I don't think Nantucket can afford not to do this. This is just one more way to address the housing, affordable housing problem that we have on Nantucket. And I have the confidence that there are enough brilliant minds on Nantucket that will figure out how to implement the program. So I, I, I don't see failure there, I see success. I don't want to say there's been no activity in this direction. We do have some affordable housing on Nantucket but we've never done enough. And this has put us in a position where the state can tell us what to do here through the 40B law. And right now, the majority, if not all of the 40Bs, are being built in one area of the island, the Surfside area. And just so everyone knows, a 40B can be anywhere on the island. It could be next door to your house. You don't need a, a large parcel for a 40B, and a, an example is the, uh, the third of an acre across the street from us right now has four units on it. So you don't need two acres, you don't need three acres. A 40B can be put on any parcel, providing that the services required uh, are available. I, I just, I, I urge everyone to uh, support this article, and uh, what it also does is it, it spreads affordable housing out everywhere on the island. Um, th this plan is based on uh, houses that are for sale. So a complete explanation or financial right now is not available. Once they have the funds, they can start buying properties and the decision process will, will go on from there. And if it's not a perfect system, we tweak it next year. But I think we need to have control over the face of Nantucket and not 40B developers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Soda? Maria Zoda, 3 Diana Speech Road. Just a couple questions to, so that I can vote intelligently. I believe the Finance um, Committee said there was a strategic plan but I think they were looking for a business plan that actually had some hard numbers, is that correct? Sorry, Maria. Um, I was referring to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund strategic plan. Right. We did get, and we did have a, a, a pro forma business um, set of financials put together by the proponent with some help from members of the Finance Committee. So we were able to look at uh, a business plan with projections out over 20 years with debt service and the usual and customary elements of the plan. Okay, and, and it is my understanding that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is going to be the main administrative entity for the town to see us through this very large problem. Is that correct? I guess I'm asking the Board of Selectmen. Yeah, do you want to get all your questions? Do you have like a list of questions? So no, have, I just have two questions. That's okay. question that two. Okay, great. So is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund going to be the main administrative entity for the town to work on this project for okay. us? Thank you. Hang on. Yeah, go ahead. So to answer the question, yes, the Affordable Housing Trust will be in charge of developing the process that allows us to put this in place. And I do feel that after the strategic plan that we've done over the past year, we are in a position to be able to develop this. It is not something we have focused on entirely to date because it falls outside of um, our our plan at the moment and because we needed to see what would happen tonight, but we are in a position where we can do that. The management of the properties would then most likely be another entity that would be would specialize in management. Thank you. 
Mr. Beal? Just if you if you leap up, a microphone will appear behind you before you even know it. Thank you, Mark Beal. I have a question for Mr. Worth through the moderator, if I may. Uh, Mr. Worth made a rather convincing case why this is a um, not the best financial plan, and yet the finance committee is recommending it. Could he uh, explain the difference between those two? I will. I will ask him. Be delighted to. Uh, so, um, and I perhaps uh, glossed over this a little bit um, um, too quickly. So, in, in the course of our deliberations, we spent some time talking about a proof of concept or a demonstration. And there was support in the Finance Committee to see if we started with a lower number, whether in fact this is the kind of program that would work without committing 20 million or 30 million dollars uh, to this. Uh, we talked about what kinds of question was posed directly to the proponents. How would you measure success in this project? We didn't really get much of a business answer to how what's going to be success in this project. I guess acquiring the properties may in and of themselves be success. But we thought if we did a demonstration project and that, and that the voters supported that, and it worked, and we came back here next year and said this was a smashing success, or a moderate success, but it's helping advance our solution to affordable housing, that the town meeting would be predisposed to spending some more money next year and subsequent to that. If it turns out that we're, we have an inability to execute on the project or program, um, or we can't find the properties, or we can't organizationally get this set, then you know we haven't uh, potentially squandered a lot of money by buying buying properties that we then have a, have a hard time managing. So that I hope that squares the circle because that's what we were trying to achieve. Thank you. Yep, up in the back. Uh, Jim Kilowa. Uh, it's just a couple questions I have. Uh, our financial stewards uh, are recommending the ten million dollars. And then at the last minute, we have a doubling of that. Maybe the person, who, the selectman who uh, could maybe explain the reasons why he's doubling this at the last minute. And also, the sponsor of the article, does he feel that uh, bumping the money up double might jeopardize it at the ballot box? Uh, so, on behalf of the select board, um, the discussion that we had about this article, um, it, this article did start at 30 million, and then after the FinCom public hearings was, went down to 10. After speaking with the proponent and looking at the numbers that he put forward, the select board did decide to put it back up to 20 million, and there are a couple reasons for that. One is that this really is about 40B, and it's 24 units that we need to be able to secure to put ourselves in safe harbor and protect ourselves from 40Bs. There's, it, that's one of our, our goals, one of the select board's strategic goals, is getting safe harbor and precluding the opportunity for more 40Bs. Additionally, we like this. We feel this is a valuable tool in the toolbox for affordable housing. It is expensive. This is the cost of deferring the issue for as long as we have. So what we did like about it is that it is scatter site, so it does not require density. It can be existing homes, so it does not necessarily mean there's more construction or more building. And uh, ultimately, again, it comes back to the 40B. So that was our reasoning. The project was designed to be uh, to operate at 15 to 20 million dollars, and we felt that if, if we're going to do this, getting ourselves to safe harbor, we can't tiptoe into safe harbor. So we felt that putting it back up to 20 million was key in order to make this work. Thank you. Yes, up in the back. Uh, Charity Benz. Um, listening to this and last night, uh, and certainly listening to Mr. Worth, who I think is fiscally sound in what he's suggested. Um, this is almost like, it almost seems like throwing spitballs at a wall and you hope that one's going to stick. And um, 
Last night, I think we passed Article 28, which would almost appear to be the pilot test for whether something like this would be successful. And if, you, if we proceed with the $5 million through the um, uh, preservation uh, fund, you will have an indication of whether or not something like this is uh, viable. The other thing I wanted to ask is if we pass this and we cannot buy any property and we cannot get this done and we borrow the money to pay for it, are we paying, when this is bonded, are we paying interest from the moment we get the bond whether or not we get a, we're able to buy property or not? In other words, are we paying interest with no uh, outcome? And for how long would that be? And has anybody predicted that? Mr. Turbett? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Moderator. Brian Turbett, Finance Director. Uh, to answer the question, we would not permanently borrow this money till we actually had uh, homes that were going to be purchased. If we needed to, we would borrow short term um, to pay to purchase the homes and then permanently borrow at a time that was at most advantageous to the town, looking at what debt was coming off the, out, off the amortization tables on an annual basis. Um, so we would not be running out immediately if this were successful tonight and at the ballot box and borrowing 20 million and then obligating the town to be required to pay it back if the program didn't work. So. It, it's not a instantaneously instantaneous borrowing. It's a measured borrowing based on the needs of the affordable housing trust in terms of properties that have been identified and have gone through the process and the town actually is entered into an agreement to purchase. Does that answer your question? Hang, hang on. You really need a microphone, even though I can oddly hear you, but... If that's the case, and it's projected that this article would cost uh, each taxpayer in the $50, $60, something like that a year, how is that going to, uh, how are you going to work that into the tax rates? Excuse me, that, um, that projection is, if, is presented as if it was on the tax bill for fiscal 19. This would not be put into the tax rate until in such time that we permanently borrowed and was added to the um, to our schedule, our, our debt schedule. So it conceivably, if this were to pass and move forward, it could be one to two years before we actually permanently borrow the money and actually and put it into the tax bill. And then, if you had one property that you could buy, are you just simply going to borrow the money for that one property, or are you going to run ahead and buy, borrow twenty million dollars? We would not I can, we're not going to run ahead and borrow 20 million, okay? Typically the way we do with any projects that are authorized is we do what's known as a bond anticipation note and we carry that for anywhere between 9 to 12 months before we make the decision on whether to permanently borrow. We don't actively go into the market and just permanently borrow every project that's authorized. We typically look for the most advantageous time, trying to time not only the, the addition of debt, but the retirement of debt at the same time to try to smooth the impact to the taxpayers. Well, then that can, obviously what, begs wait, the wait, question. Wait, Ms. Can if I could just finish and I'll shut up. But if that obviously, if if that obviously begs the question and feeds into what Mr. Worth was saying, that you have a pilot project and that the commitment, uh, you know, we, have, we would probably have at least another year to review the outcome of this before we make a very serious commitment. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holgate? So look, before Ms. Holgate um, I just, talks, just I just, can I just mention, I'd really like to stop the, the crossing talk. I know it's, I've let it happen because people were answering questions, but if we could direct all comments through me and then back, that would be great. Sorry, Ms. Holgate, go ahead. That's okay. Um, I just, wanna, just wanted to add a few things. Um, this is an article that was thought up with a very defined goal in mind um, to get to our number one strategic goal, which is to get 24 units for Safe Harbor. Um, we would only borrow this if we have concrete plans and process in place and need those 24 units to gain Safe Harbor. 
it could come through other ways that are in the works in a number of different areas. This is also um, a clever idea based on community desire for scattered site, not high density single location developments. It's something where we could potentially find properties with primary and secondary dwellings that could both be rentals and um, see them throughout the area, I mean throughout, throughout the island. Um, and you know, the, the main goal here is to get to that finish line of 10%. This could potentially get us over that when you add in the other things that are in the works to be built. And again, it just, it will not, there are a lot of checks and balances in here to fully vet this through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, through the select board, and through a public process with community input. So I just wanted to add those things. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Jennifer Cohen. I'm the president of Housing Nantucket. And if anyone's not familiar with Housing Nantucket, we're in our 25th year of buying scattered site um, houses, and it's a rental program, and we have housed hundreds of people over these 25 years. And I wanted to address something a little bit from the previous, the $5 million. One of the things that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund has done over the past year with some of the money that's been allocated to it is give grants to the Housing Nantucket and to Habitat for Humanity to build and to recycle homes that have provided homes for fellow Nantucketers in our rental program. Um, the other thing I would have to say is uh, with regard to this article, we have quite a breadth of experience in terms of putting together programs here on Nantucket. Housing Nantucket runs the Covenant program. I could foresee something very similar to that. In fact, some of these homes could potentially end up in the Covenant program. And I think we all know and have people who have been touched by it and have been really benefited by the Covenant program. Um, so in terms of a, pr a frame of reference of w how things can be managed and what we have locally here to help with these sort of resources, know that we have people who have experience um, doing this. And I don't think it will be done in a um, slapdash way. I think they'll put together a group of people with the knowledge and institutional experience to pull together programs like this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Atherton. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, my name is Rick Atherton. Um, I was involved with the uh, creation of this article from the very beginning. And uh, while I have a rather extensive experience as a member of the Finance Committee, I think their um, operational concerns are missing what I think is the real point of the article. I think the comments by our select board members are much more on target. I think of this almost as an article that we can't afford not to move forward. Anybody who was here during the summer when the Surfside Crossing development came before the ZBA through on-island developers needs to appreciate the impact that 40Bs can have on anybody's neighborhood. You know, 15 years ago, there was a 40B in Pacamo just to help put things in perspective. And this article I think of as almost like an insurance policy. It gives the ability to the board to step into the market, to acquire units that can be put on our shy list, and make sure we re reach safe harbor on an annual or the cumulative 10% basis. Hopefully, we're willing to sort of bear that burden so the impact on any one neighborhood is mitigated. And I just think that's um, something we as a community need to undertake this evening in approving the article. I'm sad that it, not sad, that's not the right word, 
disappointed we don't have 30 million. I don't know how many units we're gonna need to make sure we reach safe harbor and never experienced another 40B like is happening on South Shore Road. 20 is certainly better as a backup than 10. So I urge us all to vote in favor of the article and to do it at the ballot box. The money won't be spent if we reach 40B compliance in the shy list without needing the article. So the questions about interest and all of that are going to be moot. It's only if we need it to meet those commitments. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fredericks? Oops. Sorry, Ms. Adams, making you run. Hello, uh, Dave Fredericks, Ms. Moder uh, moderator. I had a quick question. It's really a point of clarification, um, and it really is uh, the bottom part of the article where the selectmen have done some housekeeping. I wanted to make sure, because I think it's critical if I read it correctly, what it's trying to say is there are parts of this article that obviously need more detail. There are policies that need to be written. There's a process to passing out or spending money, and that eventually comes back to and is under the control of the Board of Selectmen, as I understand it. So some of the things and some of the details we're looking for are in their control. There's a fair amount of due process. There's, a fair, there's certainly public input, and that's where a lot of these details will be worked out. I would say I heard a lot of really good things, and I'm not going to repeat them all, but when you, when you think about what the selectmen said, when you think about Rick's point, and you look at what Ms. Cohen said, these programs are meant to give us yet another tool, and I hope we give the tool to the selectmen, and I would just lo like the clarification that I'm reading the purpose of that language cleanup as putting you folks in control of making sure those safeguards will be in place. Ms. Goldberg? Madam Moderator, through you. Um, the uh, intent of these language changes is to make clear that the Board of Selectmen will be approving any expenditures of these monies. However, putting uh, too much information right into the actual warrant article would be exceptionally limiting, and the goal is to not um, place that kind of limitation on the borrowing itself. Of course, the Board of Selectmen will have to meet in an open session to discuss adoption of policies, et cetera, and so people will have an opportunity to weigh in and um, provide input uh, on many occasions. Madam Moderator. Uh, yes, the Board of Selectmen decides when to borrow. Okay. Yes, up by Mrs. Topham. Eliza Otani. Uh, point of clarification, I had been um, told recently that both Habitat for Humanity and the Covenant Houses are not counted as part of our shy list. Can you clarify that and address whether any of this money could go to correcting that policy? Mr. Holland? Uh, Tucker Holland, Housing Specialist. So I think the question was Habitat Houses counting on our SHI list. And it is correct that um, in the past the units have not counted. The Habitat has been eager to have them count and it has been working uh, with the town and the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is the state agency that is the arbiter of what goes on to the SHI list. And um, we're in the process of, call it a test case, of getting the first of uh, anticipated additional habitat units onto the list. The income levels that habitat serves do qualify from the income level standpoint. Thank you. Again, up by um, Mrs. Topham. Yeah. My name's Renee Seeley, Executive Director of the Nantucket Housing Authority. 
Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Housing Authority, um, just as a citizen who's been busy with affordable housing and involved in it since uh, the 1980s. I just want to kind of remind everyone historically that all of the successes we have had to date on affordable housing, uh, the creation of the Housing Authority, the donation of land for purposes of uh, the Housing Authority or Housing Nantucket and Habitat for Humanities, success at developing affordable housing, the, um, all of these things were public initiatives. All of these actions were due to this body of government right here, town meeting. You folks through the years have shown political courage to, at less, to, to uh, let us accomplish even what we have done, but it is not enough. And I want to echo Mr. Tafe, uh, Mr. Um, uh, well, Atwood? <laughs> Atherton. Atherton, sorry, forgot. Um, that we can't afford not to do this, and I too wish it was $30 million, because right now we cannot compete with uh, the real estate speculators and developers. We just can't. We have to have the ability to access cash, to access money, and this article is going to allow us to do that and it does have a very specific purpose that it is intended to put units of housing on the shy list, which will protect us from the 40B developers, which, you know, the Housing Authority is a 40B develop, developer. Sachem's Path is a successful 40B development. So there are some, but when, we're, when they're done by nonprofits, they, we create more affordable housing units than what a private developer might come in to try to do, where we're only getting 25% with no guarantee that the entire development, like uh, Surfside Crossing, is not counted on the Chai list. So, I mean, $20 million. It, it, we can't afford to not spend that on affordable housing. We're going to be spending $20 million in another roundabout if we get any more 40Bs. And, or more studies, or we just passed Article 10, where we're proposing uh, over a million dollars to study employee housing. You know, this is gonna be building it, and, and it will be managed, and I, and I do trust my Board of Selectmen, and I do trust the Affordable Housing uh, Board, and, and you, you, you have to allow, again, that's that political card, that's the trust that we have to apply because they know the problem, they are trying to solve the problem, and we have to trust that they're going to do that. So again, I want to, um, to urge that you vote affirmative on this article. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, way up in the back in that section. Uh, and could you remove your hat, please? I'm sorry. I can't, when you don't have, when you have a hat Thank on, you, I Thank you, Madam Moderator. David Iverson. Um, Mr. Worth was right. This is an expensive deal, but we need to understand what we're getting for this premium. We're getting control. As a community, we get to control this sort of development here. What, also, what we're getting for that premium is we know what we're getting. We are going to spend at least $10 million in upgrades in our infrastructure for the 40B or the bigger developments going on right now. What's it gonna cost us in rotaries and upgrades for the Richmond project? If the Surfside Crossing ever gets through, what's it gonna cost us in sewer upgrades? Again, rotaries, streets. So 20 million in relation to what it's gonna cost us as a community to let this runaway development go on is nothing. So I say raise it to 30 and it'll still be cheaper than upgrading our infrastructure for people who are making money on developments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no, please don't do that. Um, okay, on, yes, up by you again, Mrs. Topham. It's pure coincidence that I'm speaking after Dave Iverson. My, my name is David Pumphrey and I support this article. I think we have to keep a positive attitude. We cannot be <laughs> negative about this. It's maybe it's not a perfect analogy, but uh, parents planning to send their son or daughter to university and asking their beloved child if they're going to get a job when they graduate. You know, should I be spending this money? Yes, we should be spending this money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fee?
Yeah, I look at this. I think we should support this. Uh, back in the comp plan days, we did uh, consensus building, and one thing that came out of that is that we wanted to do it in all different areas of the island. This allows us to do this. Housing, we should be thinking about as economic and community preservation. If we don't have employees here to work all the different jobs that we need, we don't really have an island. If we don't have people that live here year round, if it's just a bunch of tourist homes, is it really a place we want to live in anymore? Uh, I think Toby's vision is, is, you know, Toby is great at the vision. He's got a, a big vision and he's right on this. Uh, the details, he's a lot better than we, we were when we started. And I think, you know, half a year, a year from now, we'll have those details. Uh, you know, and a lot of them are already there. The different incomes that, we, that, that will be involved are all positive. We don't just need 80 percent. We need 80 up to, you know, up to 200 percent. But if, we can, if he can buy four homes, if the Affordable Housing Trust can buy four homes and one is at 80, we can have a couple others at other income levels, which is needed for a lot of the jobs in the town and other jobs. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is really just beginning. They need to be thinking bigger. Nantucket, 10 percent of you know, of our year round isn't enough to preserve our community. Places like Aspen and Whistler and places like that, they aim for 50 percent of all their homes. You know, if we think that the market is going to solve this, that we're delusional. The market is what's causing this. It's the externality. It's the people from outside who have a lot more money buying tourist homes and having those homes used more frequently in the summer. They're investments. That's what's driving, you know, our kids and our future kids out. So, you know, I support this. Uh, I hope that it gets supported at the ballot. I hope bumping it to 20 million wasn't a mistake. And I, and I also share some of David Worth's concerns. You know, this has to be done uh, thoughtfully and it has to be done properly. And I, you know, I hope the select board going forward, I'm sure, will make sure that happens. So thank you. Thank you. So up, yep. Mr. Sullivan. <coughs> Brian Sullivan, um, member of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So we, we sit here today at an inflection point like we did many years ago in the early 80s when we enacted the land bank. And they have done an amazing job protecting and preserving this island. They've also done an amazing job of creating a model that this program can follow. It's a model of land acquisition and protection for our community. Um, I can't remember the date, but at one point we bonded $30 million for the land bank to go out and be able to make advanced purchases in the community. I remind you that this body over the last few years has sat here and voted to send a housing bank bill to the state house to generate a consistent funding source to be used as affordable housing. Yet at the state house level, it hasn't passed. Here we are today creating our own destiny and we're deciding in this room what we're gonna do with it and we're making that decision here and now. I encourage everyone to support the 20 million and I encourage you to speak to a few friends and get out to the ballot and vote for it in support. While there are details and items to be worked through, the Board of Selectmen's changes point out that there is oversight every week at their meeting. Everyone can come and attend. You can watch on the YouTube channel or on channel 18. Everybody can come to our public meetings. I would support you to do that. Call me on the telephone, talk about it, give ideas. This is our opportunity to solve a problem that we have in front of us, and here we stand today at an inflection point in our community to make a positive decision. So I support the room and encourage all of you to support this article. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Just, oh, Mr. Beal. I just want to go one, just to one more person, right? Yes, you had your hand up. Go ahead and stand up and get a microphone, right? Yep. Yes. And then we'll and then we'll vote because I'm not sensing anyone speaking against this. So go go ahead. Okay, um, Ann Cuspa, I'm the director of Housing Nantucket. Um, I just wanted to express appreciation for Tobias for bringing this idea to the table. I also wanted to express appreciation to the finance committee because of their scrutiny and um, vigorous attempts to understand it. It really. Um, helped us to think about the details of the program. I worked personally with Tobias, um, with town staff, Tucker Holland, as well as Brooke Moore, the vice chairman of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, to really 
grind out those numbers and make sure that they were correct and they are feasible. I like the talk that I hear about getting to 10%. It's not just about safe harbor, it's about meeting our goal, and it's the law, Chapter 40B, to provide 10% of affordable housing. These are people who are living here. Um, I heard the term spitballing a program. I would disagree with that. Um, I would like to think it is modeled after a, a successful program, which is our affordable rental program, Housing Nantucket's affordable rental program. We house um, many people uh, just across the street from the high school. I heard it's actually not a 40B, it's within zoning. And in those houses, there is a hospital employee, there's someone who pumps your gas, someone who uh, pours your coffee, and someone who takes care of the elderly. So those are all people who we need here. And um, all of these units are going to be on the shy list and it's very important. So um, thank you and I hope you join me in uh, voting in favor of this article. Thank you. Okay, I think people are really, you wanna, go ahead, stand up. Just, I haven't recognized you yet, Mr. Beale, but I know you're there. <laughs> go ahead, stand up and take, take the microphone and then we'll, then, I think then we can just go to a vote. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I've been having my hand up for a while. And nobody saw it. Um, I'm, Could I'm you not give with us a, your name? I'm Kate Raphael. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a taxpayer. I'm not a board member of any board. I'm not part of the Housing Authority. I'm a taxpayer, and I have questions that I'd love to have answered. Um, could it, this article is so vague, and I know you've all done a great job explaining many um, parts of this idea of what you'd like to do with this money. But my question is this. Uh, could you please explain with the, if the, when the town purchases these properties, um, would they then be selling them to the people who uh, qualify? Or would we still be owning them and renting them and being responsible for upgrades and upkeep and taxes? That's what has not been explained yet. So I'd like to know what happens after these properties are purchased. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Worth? Uh, sure. So um, the plan is uh, these units will not be sold. They will be rented, and it'll be the responsibility uh, ultimately for the town for uh, debt service and for maintenance and uh, upgrades and any uh, capital expenditures that are necessary over time. It's a fairly standard rental program, and you know you can talk with uh, the housing Nantucket people. I'm in there. You know it's a, it's all pretty standard, but it is total rental housing. It's not going to be resold to uh, to the people that are there or on the open market. Thank you. Okay, so this does require a two thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion, a no vote will defeat the motion. What you're voting on is the Finance Committee's motion as amended by Mr. Bridges, and those amendments are shown in yellow on the screen, changing it to, to $20 million and adding this other language. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. I declare that is adopted by a two-thirds vote. Okay, Article 47 was originally called by Dr. Butterworth and then Ms. Miller stepped in. And do I understand, Ms. Miller, you don't wanna go forward with this article? Correct? Okay, so because we're here, I, I think what I'll do is I will recognize Mr. Rector, Chair of the Planning Board, for the purpose of making the motion of the Planning Board, which appears on page 59 of the warrant, I'd ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading of that. And is that your motion, Mr. Rector? So moved, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Second. All right, that motion is made and seconded. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to discuss this. I don't see any hands, so 
A yes vote will adopt the motion of the planning board. A no vote will defeat that motion. It does require a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. That was so weak. <laughs> it's like you really didn't have it. Um, all right, I'm going to try that again. I just, if you could sort of enunciate a little. No, I don't want you to scream, but. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay, that is adopted by a declared two-thirds vote. Thank you very much. Okay. So, that takes us to Article 63. You can just put it there. Article um, 63 appears on page 84 of the warrant, continues to page 85. There were technical changes that I read in at the beginning of the meeting yesterday that changed the 30 feet above to the maximum height requirements as specified in this chapter measured from the minimum elevation at which the first floor of the structure will conform, et cetera. Is that your motion, uh, Mr. Rector? Is there a second? Second. That motion is made and seconded. Now, Mr. Reed is the sponsor of this article, and he has an amendment that he would like to make, I believe. Thanks, Mayor. Am I on? Yes. You are on. Okay. Uh, the uh, article as... Uh, recommended by the planning board with the planning board's uh, changes to the language um, makes it, first of all, those changes uh, took away the point that the um, 30 feet would be allowed in every district. The, the fact is that the height in uh, the districts uh, varies and what I'm proposing is that the um, maximum height would be two feet less than the uh, maximum in that district over the first floor rather than over grade. I think, uh, do you want me to stick to the amendment or do you want me yeah, to go to the article? I think I, I need to explain the article to make the amendment make any sense. Okay, let's get the amendment on the floor first though. So that's your amendment right there. That is right? my amendment. Okay, so it would be to, to strike the language that shown is stricken and add in so that it reads, shall not exceed a height which is two feet lower than the maximum height requirement in the zoning district, including any overlay district in which the structure is situated as specified in this chapter, measured from the minimum elevation, et cetera. Is that your motion? Yes, it is, Madam is there, Moderator. Is there a second? That motion is made and seconded. Go ahead, Mr. Reed. Okay, the point of this article is as follows. First of all, we start with the point that there is as we all know, change taking place in sea level, uh, regardless of what the causes may be, and there are probably many of them, climate change is taking place, it's inevitable, and the uh, FEMA regulations as a result of that with regard to flood zones have required the minimum uh, elevation of the first floor of structures in, within those flood zones to be higher They'd all, if they'd been at uh, uh, basically eight feet above uh, uh, mean high tide, mean, uh, rather mean tide datum of 1934 uh, for a long time, and now they're at about 11 feet above the, the present datum that they're using, and that may change over the years. The point of this is that that is going to result necessarily in the height of structures being increased and that results in pushing the height of the structure up against the uh, maximum under the bylaw. Now, this article is actually, it started as simply uh, clarifying the fact that the article as printed, the existing uh, language as was presented, as was printed in the planning board's 
recommendation that appears in the warrant is actually part of the bylaw right now. It was uh, set up as uh, section C7 of, um, uh, of, section, 17, of uh, section 17 of the zoning bylaw. The only point is that the only special permit that is required in it or is referred to in it relates to uh, the CDT, uh, rather uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, C, yeah, the CDT district where the height can be increased under any circumstances by special permit. The point is that it was set up and, is, and reads as being uh, uh, permitted as a matter of right in all districts. So we we're moving that out of the section on special permits uh, so that it would be properly situated within the bylaw. After hearing some comments about this, uh, I thought that it would be appropriate to make certain clarifications in the planning board recommendation, namely that the uh, height shouldn't be 30 feet, which is what the bylaw actually says right now, above the first floor. That actually gives a, a windfall to someone uh, in this situation because under normal circumstances, the first floor of any house is going to be uh, two feet above grade at least, depending obviously upon topography and circumstances, but almost always it's going to be about two feet uh, above grade or more. So we're making it be two feet less than the maximum that would otherwise be allowed in the district. And we're also clarifying it to show that, the, uh, that this relates to the maximum in the district, not to 30 feet. And uh, in the district where uh, uh, the um, uh, VR district, where the maximum is 25 feet uh, set as an overlay that applies to the, uh, part of that district, that would not be increased over the 25 feet. In fact, the result would be that in those districts it would be 23 feet above the first floor uh, that would be allowed under this. Again, this is not new language. It's not a new concept. It was passed four years ago, and this is simply a tweak in order to make it more appropriate, actually less um, uh, extensive in terms of the height that would be allowed because of the two feet below the maximum uh, that we've put in by way of the amendment. Uh, I have the honor of being the uh, uh, only person speaking or rather proposing a zoning amendment tonight, presenting the, the amendment. Uh, usually such a big part of the uh, uh, town meeting is turned over to zoning articles and uh, I think it's quite remarkable that we have no other zoning articles being uh, discussed or debated with the various ones that were not called. And in any event, that's what we propose, and thank you very much, and hope you'll vote for the article. Thank you. Mr. Cohen? Uh, Stephen Cohen, I'm a, an attorney, and I am not speaking on behalf of a client on this. In fact, just the opposite. I want to support Mr. Reed's amendment uh, and take uh, money away from lawyers and let things happen without requiring people going to the zoning board to get a special permit that they uh, is regularly granted. I think to try to put it in in simple terms, uh, Mr. Reed had the complicated uh, uh, responsibility to explain this, but the reality is that the impact is that. People have to go to the zoning board to get permits for something that is regularly granted, and so it's just you know wasting time and money. And so, since this was already adopted by town meeting four years ago, I'd ask you to take that burden off them and let it happen the way it's being proposed. Uh, the lawyers will be fine. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Stott. I think you were not on the amendment. Not on the amendment. Okay, so just on Mr. Reed's amendment. Okay, so this amendment requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt the amendment. A no vote will defeat the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. That amendment is unanimously adopted. Okay, now on the main motion as now amended by Mr. Reed, um, Mr. Stott, are you standing in for Ms. Forbes tonight? Okay. 
Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Charlie Stott, and I'm representing the Madigan Residents Association, and I'm pinch hitting for MRA Vice President Leslie Forbes, who was unable to be here tonight. As we understand it, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Reed for that amendment. I think it improves the, uh, the article. But as we understand Article 63, it proposes to remove the special permit requirement to which Mr. Cohen just spoke for structures in two FEMA designated flood zones island wide and allow applications by right. For this reason, the Board of Directors of the Madigan Residents Association voted to oppose this article. The HDC has scrutinized structure height for decades. For most zoning districts, the maximum building height is 30 feet. Keeping structures at 30 feet has been important to Nantucket's sense of place and history. Most of Madigan, however, as has been previously noted, is in the village height overlay district where the maximum building height is 25 feet. This article would move height limitation to by right in the two FEMA 100 year flood zones. In flood zones, the bylaw already allows the ridge height to be calculated from the first floor, not grade. So actual height, as has been noted, above grade may be greater than the 25 or 30 foot maximum height. A little less now because of the amendment that was just adopted. However, moving the height limitation to by right removes an official basis for neighbors to be notified and to speak for neighborhood sensibilities. A special permit requires about a notification and an opportunity to ask for conditions. Please vote no in this article. Keep the special permit requirement. Okay. Ms. Melton? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Emily Molden for the Nantucket Land Council. The Land Council also issued a negative recommendation on this article, and I just wanted to take a moment to explain why. Also, thanks to Mr. Reed for the proposed amendment, which I do think uh, improves the, the article. So, as you just heard from Mr. Stott, the areas in these flood zones, uh, which encompass a large part of Brant Point, as well as properties along Hither Creek and Madiket. Uh, they face additional FEMA and building code requirements to build higher, and that may be one of the best ways to build resiliency into some of these coastal communities, coastal neighborhoods. However, we recognize, as Mr. Stott said, that the increased building height in these areas definitely has the potential to significantly impact scenic views and just the sense of these neighborhoods. As it stands right now, the property owners certainly have the ability to get a special permit and to increase the height of the structures, but we do think it's important for neighbors and for those affected in these neighborhoods to continue to be part of that process and provide their input. So we would also encourage you to vote down this article and just keep the bylaw as it stands right now and require the special permit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is a zoning bylaw change. It requires a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion of the planning board as amended by Mr. Reed. A no vote will defeat that motion. Mr. Reed? I would just point out that the existing language of the bylaw, which I will read, it's very brief, does not say that a special permit is required. It was inadvertently placed under special permit, apparently, when the, um, when it, when the bylaw was, uh, uh, after it was passed and, and when it was codified. It says, the height of a structure which is situated within the, you know, cut through and say flood zones, as from time to time revised, shall not exceed 30 feet above the minimum height at which the first floor of the structure will conform with all applicable building codes and FEMA requirements, except in the CDT district where maximum height may be determined by special permit. I guess that reference to special permit, which is only applicable to the CDT district, is how it got put under the 
uh, uh, caption with various other things for a uh, special permit within section 17 of the bylaw. That language, if not passed, would stay there, and I would point out that it actually would allow for a special permit to go up to 30 feet, whereas uh, if, my, uh, if the article, as proposed with my amendment, passes anything over 28 feet above the first floor, you know, in a 30-foot zone, would require um, uh, a variance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So a yes vote will adopt the motion as amended by Mr. Reed. A no vote will defeat the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. That motion is not adopted. Okay. So article sixty six. Article sixty six appears on pages eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight of the bylaw. I mean of the warrant. What am I saying? The the warrant. There was a technical amendment that we read in at the beginning of the meeting yesterday under construction. We added Monday through Saturday and before 10 a.m. on Sunday. So the hours of prohibition are 8, 8, 8 p.m. to 7 and 7 a.m. or between June and September, 7.30 a.m. Monday through Saturday and before 10 a.m. on Sunday. And then also in subsection D, their hours had been mistakenly dropped, so those are added. It's prohibited between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m. between June 15 and September 15 in each year, Monday through Saturday and before 10 a.m. Sunday. The same change under E to clarify that the Sunday hours remain before 10 a.m. And that's it. So I recognize Mr. Worth for the purpose of making the motion as printed in the warrant as changed by those amendments. And that is our motion, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Second. Motion is made and seconded. Now this was called by hmm, Mr. Coombs maybe? Is the person who called this article here? No. Okay. Well, maybe everyone's happy with it. We can just go to a vote. This is a bylaw amendment, but not a zoning bylaw amendment. So it requires just a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. That motion is adopted by a majority voice vote. Okay. Article 71. Article 71 starts on page 92, continues to page 93. The original Finance Committee motion as printed in the warrant was to take no action. We did read in a positive motion last night. We're going to scroll through that. The changes from the text that's printed in the warrant is highlighted in yellow. So in subsection 5714A, we've added with the exception of major intersections to be determined by the town of Nantucket. In subsection B, We've stricken or driveway and added with the exception of major intersections to be determined by the town of Nantucket. And we've added at the end of 5714, for the purposes of paragraphs A and B in 5714, a major intersection shall be considered to be the intersection between a main road, e.g. the Milestone Road, or a secondary road that bears as much vehicular traffic as a main road and a multi-use shared path. 
The determination by the Town of Nantucket shall consist of recommendations by the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee to the Select Board after consultation with the Department of Public Works and the Nantucket Police Department. In 57-15, there was just a typo. Um, we corrected divers to driver's vehicle. In 57-16, a change related to the database. The chief of police or his designee shall continue to maintain databases of all motor vehicle accidents involving bicycles. Said databases shall be a public record and shall be made available to the public via a link on the town website. In B, database was changed to databases. In C, we added, shall be requested by the town of Nantucket to make a report to the chief of police for inclusion in the accident databases. In D, database was changed to databases. So with, with that, is that your motion, Mr. Worth? Yes, it is, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Second. Okay, the motion is made and seconded. Um, this was called by Ms. Longacre, who I think has a one word change she wanted to make. Uh, Mary Longacre, in uh, 5716, paragraph B, where it's talking about the database shall include the date, time, and location of the accident the number of vehicles, bicycles involved, and whether the bicyclist suffered any injury. Uh, if we're keeping a database and, and recording injuries, I would suggest that we, or I would make, make a motion that we change the words the bicyclist to any person. Uh, it could be a pedestrian injured, it could be the driver or passenger in the car injured. It just seems to me that we'll probably eventually want to know that information, um, and we should just have it from the start. Okay. And perhaps the chief of police and the author of the article could speak to whether that is within their intent here. Okay. So your motion would be to amend the word bicyclist in 5716B to any person. Is, is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. So just on the amendment. Okay. So this requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt the amendment. A no vote will defeat the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. That amendment is adopted unanimously. On the main motion now of the Finance Committee as amended by Ms. Longacre. Mr. Reed. My name is Arthur Reed. Uh, I am rising in support of this article, but with a couple of comments that I would make. Uh, I don't ride a bicycle. Uh, my, my, my wife does. There are two things that I find a subject of enormous annoyance in terms of the operation of bicycles on the island. One is when bicyclists are for no reason using a, uh, the, the road rather than the bike path where the bike path is located. I think that uh, obviously there are circumstances in which the bike path can't be used, but under normal circumstances they should stick to the bike paths. And the other is the problem of bicyclists n not observing one-way streets. Bicycles should observe the one-way streets they're required to by law, and I think that that, to the extent that it can be, should be enforced. My wife violates that frequently, and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm looking forward to the time when uh, Chief Pittman has uh, brought her to justice on that point. Because <laughs> I've been telling her for a long time, and maybe, maybe she'll listen to it from Bill, her fellow wharf rat. Uh, I think that this is all in all is an excellent article, seriously. Uh, the, obviously the uh, uh, point of keeping track of the situation of bicycles and of making sure that, that people respect people who are, who are riding bicycles is a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, yep, up in the back. Wait. Yep. Yes, um, Gloria Grimshaw. I'm a little confused by the article um, and would like it explained a little further in regards to where the right of way begins and ends for a cyclist. For example, um, the Tom Nevers Road, when you're coming on to um, Milestone Road, there's a stop sign for a cyclist there as well as for a vehicle. Who is the bicycle forfeiting the right to stop at that stop sign? You know, as Arthur um, Reed was pointing out, so many cyclists don't obey the one-way streets, nor do they obey the stop signs. I'm surprised there haven't been more accidents. Okay. Uh, Mr. Golding? There's a microphone right behind you. Hi, thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Grimshaw, that would be covered um, under uh, the provision of the exception of major intersections to be determined by the town. And so I would expect, as a member of BPAC, um, I would expect that we would advise the select board that that would be a major road so the bicyclists would have to stop there. Yes, no, absolutely. So this is sort of a common sense bill, I would say, and is directed more at the signs uh, that are on minor roads and dirt roads that bicyclists go through and, um, you know, to the annoyance of motorists and it's just not a safe situation. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman here moving out into the aisle, if you could get him a microphone. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I'm Dick Millard, and I was a little uh, confused and taken aback by the last question and response. Uh, the response seemed to indicate that we were going to do away with the current stop signs on the bike paths. Did I understand that correctly? I, I didn't read the article that way. And I thought when Ms. Grimshaw asked uh, uh, about bicyclists' obligation to stop, she wanted to confirm that those, that those signs would remain and bicyclists would continue to have that obligation. Uh, can we confirm that they that they will? Mr. Golding? Uh, the, the, the signs would remain when the bike path uh, intersected with a major road. But would be removed where they where they intersect a minor road or, or driveway? Right, it, it would not. In other words, these, uh, Madam Moderator, yeah. may, may I read um, the statement that I had Absolutely. for this article? Thank you. So, uh, I would be surprised if a single bicyclist present this evening hasn't had a near miss or actually been hit in the past few years by a car or a truck. One of the purposes of Article 71 is to address this important issue of safety for bicyclists, pedestrians, and motorists alike. In the past few months, members of BPAC, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, have made an inventory of every single sign on every road or driveway that intersects with the 33 miles of bike paths that constitute our current network. They found that there is no uniformity of signage with each stretch of bike path having a different set of signs and protocols depending on when it was first built. One of the intents of this article is to introduce a level of uniformity where feasible that will make biking significantly safer for those using the bike path. There are currently many stop signs facing bicyclists on a large number of paths that are essentially nuisance stop signs, stop signs for minor roads and dirt roads, public and private, that have a fraction of the traffic that major roads have and are consequently ignored by bicyclists to many motorists' annoyance and to everyone's detriment. This article is a common sense approach that will limit the stop signs facing bicyclists to roads that bicyclists actually need to and should stop for. It has been approved as amended by the Select Board, the NP and EDC, BPAC, and the Finance Committee. 
The island, as we all know, is a major tourist destination, and being able to bike around the island is one of its attractions, and if you go online, one of its main selling points. At the height of the summer, the entire stock of approximately 5,000 bikes available from the various bike companies on island are rented out. In addition, there are tens of thousands of bikes that are privately owned on island, even if only a fraction of them are being ridden at any one time. Vacationing renters visiting the island with their vehicles for the first time often have no idea that they are driving through a bike path, as there are currently few stop signs alerting them to its presence on many of the island roads, Almanac Pond Road and Alter Rock Road being just two examples. There is still no sign on Barnard Valley Road to stop cars from driving right through the bike path where the fatal accident occurred last summer. No one wants a repeat of that terrible tragedy, and I urge you to support this article as an important step towards making biking safer on the island. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the right of the, yes, if you could stand, yes. Stand up and state your name, please. Hi, I'm uh, Sarah Boyce. I live at Three Year Old Post at Circle, which is in the CHM's Path Development. Um, I want to thank those that spoke out and mentioned that the stop signs would be removed. Um, we at Sachem's Path have one entrance and exit from our neighborhood, and um, I'm on the Homeowners Association board for, that, um, for our neighborhood, and we just recently requested the stop sign at the Surfside Bike Path because um, as you come up the exit of our neighborhood, you have to straddle the bike path to be able to see whether or not you can get out of that neighborhood. And so without that stop sign there, um, there is a potential for many more accidents. And that's just where I live and one example. So I can imagine that many of what um, are considered, excuse me, <laughs> what are considered minor roads or neighborhoods might not seem important to stop at, but especially in the summertime, the traffic going um, on the bike path uh, on Surfside alone is so much that it oftentimes we can't get out of our neighborhood for you know, upwards of 10 minutes. And so without that stop sign there, I, I, it really concerns me that there's the perception that stop signs on bike paths should be blown through. And to say it out loud in town meeting just confirms what we see on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm actually urging now, which I didn't think I would, to say no to this article because I think that um, pulling out stop signs um, to increase the traffic flow is not what we should be looking for. We should be looking for more bike safety and really um, analyzing the stop signs instead of um, taking them out because people think that they shouldn't have to stop there. Thank you. Yeah, up in the back. Please don't clap. It's really disruptive. Toby Brown, I um, also concur with the, uh, the lady up front. Um, I totally respect the bicyclists and I want them to be safe. And I also think keeping them safe by having the stop signs there will. Um, and I totally, you know, I live on Pulpus Road, totally respect the, the, the guys and girls who race on the roads. Uh, years ago, I didn't understand why they're on the roads. Now I do because they go a lot faster than the little kids, or people pushing the baby carriage, et cetera. Um, and the bike paths are not meant to be racing and, you know, Bottom line, we've got to teach people how to read a stop sign, and our parent, the parents need to be accountable. I, I see these, these tourists out there that uh, they let their little two-year-old, three-year-old just blow through these stop signs on busy intersections. And, and then, uh, so I, I, I think this is a, a bad article, but um, once again, not because I, I, we do need to do work on bike safety, and, uh, but it, we also just need to work on common sense, that's all. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rustad? If you could just stand up and someone will race to you. Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, I am on the Board of Trustees at Naw Shop, and as everyone knows, we're right across from the Richmond District. But we have the bike path that goes out to the airport and Old South Road. There's a lot of traffic on it, especially in the summer, and you've got the bicyclists, you've got the strollers, you've got everybody. And um, what we're concerned about is we have to stop before we get to the stop sign, then we inch our way across, but 
There are so many bicyclists and we have stop signs for the bicyclists because we have a lot of traffic going in and out. And uh, a lot of them don't stop. Um, and especially in the winter, you have a lot of people with no lights on their bikes and wearing black, you know, uh, you know, sweatsuits and they just fly by. So I would be personally and also for a non shop concerned about having to take out our stop signs um, right there. So thank you very much and I hope we get some clarification as to what size of um, the number of houses that are going to be involved if you're going to want to do this. Where would you do this on the island? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, way up in the back. Zona Butler. Um, I just want to tell a story. My husband drives an SUV. Anybody knows my husband? He's a big guy. He had a brand new car once, and a child, a little girl, blew through and hit his car. Uh, she wasn't hurt. She jumped up, and she went along her way. What we need to think about is the most important population on the island, and that's the children. And I think stop signs are what we need for the bike path, because even if it's an out of the way or a minor road, what you want is the decision to be made by both parties, the car coming and the bike, on those instances where you don't think are enough of, is that the bike knows to stop, because they're not bigger than a vehicle. I would hate for something tragic to happen because we thought it was more important for the bike to keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead up there. There is Sessapana Road. Um, we pull out of Top Hoot, which pulls out onto Milestone, and I'm just, I'm just mirroring what everyone has said. Um, the cyclists don't really honor the signs, but they do slow down when they see a stop sign, which gives you an opportunity to, as, as too in, involved in this intersection to make a decision. Do they stop and let you go? or do you stop and let them go? Because you have to pull across the bike path to be able to see the traffic and pull out onto the road. And I think if you remove the stop signs from Top Hoot, the cyclists have no responsibility in making that decision and will then choose to blow through the, the, the intersection and make it not only dangerous for them, but put the driver at a much higher liability risk if there's an issue. And I think both the cyclists and the driver have to own equal liability in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, way up in the back. Hi, Jody Patterson, um, 30 Quays Road. I have to mirror many of the things that are being said here tonight, particularly Zona Butler. Um, we live off of Pulpus Road. It is a very busy bike path. I take my daughter out there all the time, have since she was about two years old, and she could first ride a bike. And the first thing that I always taught her was when you see a stop sign, you have to stop. Because children don't understand this. There are a lot of children that will drive their bikes far away from their parents, and if their parents aren't there reminding them to stop, they will not stop if there is a driveway or anything else. I always taught my daughter, even if it is a driveway, even if it doesn't have a stop sign, to stop. But unless there is one there or one every few driveways or every few roads, they don't know. And like a lot of people have said, we have a lot of visitors here. They don't ride bikes regularly. They may not have the same type of rules in their town or things like that and it is a safety thing i think we all have to be responsible i think that cars should stop as well when i pull out of alter rock road i stop before i get to the bike path so i look both ways to make sure no one's flying down that hill but unfortunately we need the stop signs on the bike path because if you give them free reign, it is a safety concern. Thank you. Yes. If you want to stand up, we'll get your microphone.
Ada Ruth Wig, 34 Arkansas Ave. Um, I'd like to propose an amendment um, that would obligate the cyclist to also stop in the same way that the uh, motor vehicle would be stopping at their designated stop sign. So where, where would you propose that uh, to be? So I'd have to see because I, can, I can't scroll through the amendment because it's not in the article. Okay, go. Or it's not in the, the yep. printout. Go down. Um, Keep, may I go up? Yep, up. Um, uh, sorry, so I was, uh, can I go up to whoever has the, to talk, to, to put it in so that I can see it? But basically, I would say it's in the same structure of the, for the motor vehicle to stop, that the cyclist at their designated stop sign shall also be obligated to stop something like that. Okay, let's see. Um, the only place that I see it yeah, I think it's is, right up. Is in 5714A. Right. Right it's before at the end of A. Right before B. Right. Right there. So, you want to say um, bicyclists, pedestrians shall be obligated to stop and yield um, at their designated stop signs. Okay. Ms. Goldberg, do you have any suggestions on what we could do here? I don't really see how it fits in. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Reed. Tell me, tell me what you think. I think it goes in B, okay. which is the only place we're, ta we're talking about stop signs. Uh, in B, if you put in after, where it says uh, the third line of it as it's printed in the warrant, uh, signs and, uh, and separate stop signs facing the motor vehicle approach and the bicycle approach to the intersection. Okay. So that stop, drivers stop of scrolling. motor vehicles. Go back up. And bicyclists. Okay, so you're you're suggesting that in B we put the town shall install informative path crossing signs and separate stop signs facing the motor vehicle approach and the bicycle approach. Yes. Let's just type it up and see if we like it. To the intersection, so the drivers of motor vehicles and, and bicyclists and bicyclists. No, yeah, and of motor vehicles and bicyclists. Are warned to use all caution necessary. And what about this yielding thing? Well, I think the concept would be that, you know, you can't uh, require them both to yield. And I think that the sense is that the uh, motor vehicle, which is usually capable of doing the most damage, uh, should should be the one required to yield and let the bicyclist who stop for the stop sign pedal on through. So we should add then and and um, so motor drivers of motor vehicles and bicyclists are warned to use all caution necessary and drivers of motor vehicles are warned to yield. Well really it, it's covered by A I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So I think what's going to happen is we've we've gotten into sausage making here, and it's getting a little ugly. And so um, I think what the sponsor would like to do is change the motion to a motion to refer to what committee? 
to the B, B, BPAC. What does that stand for again? Okay. To, all right. So we're going to change the motion to the to be a motion to refer to the bicycle and pedestrian Acts advisory committee for further study and hopefully return at a later date. Is that acceptable, Mr. Golding? Okay. Good All right. Thank you. So, so the motion would then be a motion to refer to BPAC, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, for further study. Okay. BPAC. Bicycle, pedestrian, bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee for further study. Okay. So I think we could probably just go to a vote on that motion. I, I think we've proven that this needs more work. Mrs. Topham? Jeanette Topham, I have a couple of suggestions which may already be done. Do the bicycle shops and or the Chamber of Commerce put in their books or give to their clients the safety rules of a bicycle? And years ago, we used to have safety bicycling for our local school children. And the, I don't know if it was done by the sheriff. I know the sheriff at one point gave them helmets. So I just thought those might be some things that could be a little proactive also. Yes. Thank you. You knew you weren't going to get out of here without saying something, right, Mr. Young? <laughs> just, just leap to your feet and, and tell us how you do it. Th thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I had prepared a whole speech for Ian's um, article, and I, I, I appreciate what you're doing to move it forward to BPAC, and I think this needs a little bit of work to sort it out. I've had many opportunities in my lifetime to be approached all over town about people and their bikes <laughs> and, and, what, and what they do with them. I've heard about it. They go through stop signs. They go the wrong way on one-way streets. They ride on sidewalks. If my brother Robert was here tonight, he would say he thinks bicycles should be able to go wherever they want in Nantucket. At, at all the bicycle shops, um, we inform people about the rules of the road um, and how to use their bicycle. And one of the things we try to tell them is that the rules of the road for the bicycle are the same as an automobile. They're not really different rules, they're the same rules. You follow the rules of the road, you stop at stop signs, you don't, don't go the wrong way on one-way streets, you don't ride on, on the sidewalk. The people we work with is, are a small percentage of the people that ride bicycles in Nantucket. I'm not able to have my staff talk to everyone that has a bike. Um, down on the wharf where I am, you see cars come off the boat in the summertime, and they have three, four, five, six bikes on the rack on the back. I'm not sure how they learn the rules. The town does a good job of putting the rules out. The uh, Cultural District and the Visitor Service Center does a good job of putting the rules out. The rules are out there, but the reality is we've got to change the culture of Nantucket, and we've got to get rid of some of the, what we call nuisance stop signs. There are so many nuisance stop signs where bicycles shouldn't have to stop that they just ride right through them, and then it looks like bikes are riding through every stop sign, and a lot of riders, when they get to a stop sign where they should stop, don't because it seems like it's just another nuisance stop sign. So I think bringing this back to BPAC, working on it a little bit more and trying to clean up the language and make it something that works so that we can educate not only the cyclists but all the users of the ways. A lot of the bike paths now are called multi-use paths. They're rollerbladers, there's people with strollers and a lot of folks that talk tonight against this were talking about what a challenge it is when they're in their car trying to deal with bikes. And I think we should try to change the culture so that we continue to encourage bicycles and so that um, if you look at an adult on a bike, it's a good chance it's an adult that's not driving around in a car. 
So um, yes to your question. We try to inform as many people as possible, and uh, we want to keep doing that. And um, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Young. Mr. Fee, did you want to say anything? OK. Yeah, Harvey said most of it. I think this is the most important article here at this town meeting. Uh, and I, he stole some of my lines about the changing the culture. And I, it, it's, how many people here actually are bikers? Bike sometimes. Okay, how many of you people have had n near misses, close calls on the bike path? You know, that's what we're dealing with. Anyone who bikes regularly has had a car pull right in front of them and you run into the car and then they say it's your fault. No, it isn't. You just ran right in front of me. I had no stop sign. You pull right out. The cars don't pay attention because they're not worried about getting hit by a bicyclist. And so I think what has to happen is, you know, what we're trying to do at BPAC, I think the mistake we've made tonight is we didn't, in, you know, what's missing is we didn't inform the public of what really needs to happen to make the bike path safe for the bicyclists and for the cars. And I'm disappointed we're not voting it tonight, but we should do a better job of informing town meeting and come back with it. Because this is really, it's crucial. My wife was almost killed at Millie's a couple years ago by a guy who was pulling, and she, she thought he was seeing him, he, he wasn't looking, he was on his cell phone, pulled in slow, and her head was pinned underneath the tire, or her bike was pinned, and her head was like a couple inches from the tire of the car. And, and that's, you know, that's on a, she was going really slow, he was going slow, she thought he saw, saw her, and he was looking at his cell phone. She thought, he, she thought he's looking at her, he's going right into her. And so that's the stuff that we, we have to deal with. Uh, you know, as bikers, and if we want to get people out of their cars, we have to make biking and walking and other means safe. So hopefully we'll be back, or I, actually I know we'll be back, and I hope you'll support it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to vote now, I think, just on the motion that um, the matter be referred to the BPAC, Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee for further study. That does require a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. That motion is adopted unanimously. Okay, Article 76. Article 76 is on pages 98 to 99 of the warrant. The Finance Committee motion was moved not to adopt the article. I do have a positive motion from the article sponsor, which is moved that to refer the subject matter of the article to the government study committee for further action. Um, Ms. Williams, is that your motion? Okay, if you could stand up, I think Mrs. Topham will give you, or someone up there will give you a microphone. There you go. And is there a second? Motion is made and seconded, go ahead. Hello. Teresa Williams, 61 Pulpus Road. Um, I was here you last year. Yeah, hold it right up. Close Thank you. Up. Thank you. I was here last year, and the majority of the town voted to move this article to the government study committee. Um, it is about. Uh, I found myself in a dispute with the town over a contract, and when I tried to find a body to help me, the town. Um, moderator, or, or not the moderator, but the select board, the town administrator, or the school committee, I found that I was unable to get anybody to help me resolve my issue. So I was trying to create a committee that a resident could go to um, and talk about a dispute that was unresolvable with the town. Um, it was a long story, I gave it last year. I spent years with the school trying to get my son an education and after eight years in a lengthy legal battle, taking a second mortgage on my home, I came to a contract agreement with them and then they didn't honor it. And I found myself without any money to move forward to get another lawyer 
to once again go back to court and, and fight. And I'm hoping that you'll all vote to move this back into the Government Study Committee so that they can establish a place where a resident can go without being bankrupt by the town and get an answer to an un unresolvable issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? We'll get you a microphone. Hi, I'm Michelle Brady. I'm the Director of Special Services for the Public Schools. Can I also address this? Yes. Okay. Um, in my opinion, this is not necessary because we already have a system of checks and balances. We have a State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that oversees complaints from parents about their um, children's education. We have two um, systems through that. We have a problem resolution system through the department, and there's also a Bureau of Special Education Appeals. Um, parents have the right to ask for mediation. It's at no cost to themselves. They can file for a hearing, um, and then if they're not, um, if they're not satisfied with the school's um, decisions, they can go to the um, problem resolution service again at no cost to themselves, and they will investigate. Um, what happens at times is that we enter into contracts. It may be a settlement agreement. All those issues are confidential. So if this motion was passed, that would mean that we would have a committee here in Nantucket that would be going up against a state decision, and I think that that would be more contradictory as well as we can't disclose anything um, regarding students um, because of the confidentiality, so we wouldn't even be able to address this with a uh, committee that was appointed by the town. So I would urge, even though I um, just got here myself, so I wasn't involved in that situation, um, I do urge the, uh, the town to, to not address this because we already have a system to hear complaints from parents. Thank you. Mr. Lowell? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Andy Lowell. Uh, I'm a little confused. The previous speaker uh, was only mentioning disputes, uh, it seemed to me, about uh, educational matters. I thought that this uh, was this article was created for island-wide issues, and I believe that disagreements and disputes deserve uh, reasonable mediation before they get to uh, become uh, more of a matter for the law. So I would think that uh, one more committee like this added to all the committees we already have couldn't be a bad thing. Thank you. Ms. Williams? Hello. When I was speaking about what happened to me, that was just my story because I can't speak to other people's stories, but there are a lot of people out here who find themselves spending beyond their means to, to just get what's fair and right for you, whether it's with the building department, the health department, my situation with, with the school. I did everything I was supposed to do, and I acted in good faith with this town, and I think that there has to be a place where, as a resident, you can go and get a dispute settled, because I think the town is accountable to the residents when you are in an impasse, and you've been outspent, and you, there's, there is no place to go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So this is a motion to refer to the Government Study Committee for further study or further action. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion is adopted. Okay. On Article 83, our last article. Um, the Finance Committee, at the request of the um, sponsor of the article, has changed its recommendation to take no action. 
I'm going to recognize Mr. Worth, Chairman of the Finance Committee, for the purpose of making that motion to take no action. That is our motion, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Second. Motion is made and seconded. Um, this is a debatable motion, so I'll go to Mr. Cohen, the sponsor of the article, if you want to make any comment, or maybe you don't. He does not. Okay. Does anyone want to comment on this article? Mr. Balkin, you called it? Sure. If you could get a microphone. I did. I was down there. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm Bert Balkind. Uh, some of you, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Bert Balkind. Some of you might know me as Spruce. Uh, and I call this uh, because twice we have been at town meeting and we have voted to um, rest the power of the people to decide what we do with our public beaches. And I just want, I, I know this is no action. It can come up again. And I just want everyone to realize that in 2012, um, sponsored by Catherine Flanagan Stover, we passed um, an article that uh, gave the right of the people to have a say in how we use our public beaches. And then at the special town meeting in 2018, we did this again um, to uh, close some loopholes um, that were found. And so uh, I'm not going to say don't vote no on this because I guess we're going to take no action, but I just want you all to realize that. Um, we have already decided this twice at town meeting, and please just be aware if this does come up in the future that it's um, something that, you know, we have the right to decide what we do with our public beaches, especially when it comes to um, any kind of um, private use of those public beaches. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Um, I know this is a resolved issue for tonight, but I, I just can't let could, this rest without pointing out say, something. Could you say your name? Yeah, I'm Bruce Miller. Thank you. Um, the 2012 article that was passed at a town meeting specifically exempted the project that was going out in Wisconsin um, by the SBPF. Um, it was amended by Arthur Reed. It passed overwhelmingly, and again, it was that the Wisconsin Bluff project was exempted. So it's a little bit misleading to not point that out when we talk about the 2012 vote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the motion to take no action, a yes vote will adopt that motion, a no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. That motion is unanimously adopted. Now before you all run out of here, I just wanna mention one thing. Um, one of our selectmen is retiring after this election next week, and I think we want to thank him for his service. He was chair of the Finance Committee for an, a lot of years. He's put in 12 years of service, um, Mr. Kelly. And then I would recognize the chair of the Board of Selectmen for the purpose of making a final motion to dissolve the 2019 annual town meeting. While you watch on the screen all the many, 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 many names of people who helped to make this um, meeting happen, and it, it really does take a village. So thank you to every one of them. Madam Honorary, move to adjourn. Thank, dissolve. Dissolve. Thank you. Is there a second? second? Okay, motion made and seconded. Motion to dissolve. All those in favor? Any opposed? Great. You, that is adopted unanimously. Thank you.